did not stop creating. He did not stop being the creator. If you need a creative miracle, he's the creator. The narrow road is the more difficult road. But the narrow road is the one that leads to eternal life. the Lord. Well, isn't the Lord good? Is he good? He is the best friend you will ever know. He's so good. You know, I'm so thankful to have my husband with me on this trip. We've been married uh, 43 years, and we have two sons, Jonathan and David, and they're getting old. And Jonathan won't even go with me anymore because he's, uh, people walk up and they say, is this your husband? I say, no, it's my son. He said, mother, that's it. I'm not going with you anymore. He said, because everybody thinks I'm your husband and I'm not going. But he's got this gorgeous silver hair. I mean, beautiful like yours, just beautiful color. And so he gets mad at me because I can't help it. I'm renewed with, with the power of God. And I'm going to stay that way in Jesus' name. There's nothing that I would rather do than to preach the word of God and live for Jesus. He did write a good song, Living for Jesus. He wrote that the other day, and uh, I recorded it. Living for Jesus is the best thing this world has to offer. And uh, I am very thankful. But Ken's here tonight, and I wondered if you all would like to hear him talk. Say hello. You would? Okay, Ken. Come on up. They want to hear you say hello. He doesn't sound like a Canadian anymore. He's been with me too long. He's a southerner. But he loves Miss Joyce's coffee. Oh, my. He can't, she makes the best coffee. He came and knocked on my door a little bit ago, and he said, you better come out here. Joyce has made coffee. <laughs> here you go. Of course, yeah. Well, hello. <laughs> Y'all come from a house? In Canada, we say house. Down south, they say house. You know, your abode, the place you live, the place you sleep. We say boat instead of boat. You know, down south, they say boat. But I, I, I've decided that I'm really a southerner because when I call home or I talk to northerners, I say y'all, and y'all makes me a southerner. <laughs> so y'all in the south, and I'm very, very glad to be here. I'm glad that, hey, I was sitting over there thinking how happy I am that I can say I'm a Christian. But I'm even more happy that I can act like a Christian. I don't want to just tell somebody I'm a Christian. I want them to know by my actions, by my attitude, by what I say and what I do and how I treat people. Because I've heard preachers for years and years say, well, it's so easy to love God, but it's God's people. Well, I want to, I've, I've, I know this right here. I've decided this. If I can't love God's people who I can see, how can I say I love God who I can't see? So in order for me to love God, I love God's people. I'm happy to say that we've got one of the finest little churches in the country. Uh, we pastor a church and about 60 or 70 people. And honest, I look at him Sunday after Sunday, and I just feel so humble that God would let me be a pastor to these fine people. And it's the same thing here. I know it's the same thing with your pastor here. She loves you, and you need to show your love to her. I'm not saying you don't. I'm sure you do. But you know what? It's so encouraging when you get, you know, you prepare a good, a good sermon or a good message, and you, and you just give everything you got to them. And when you come up, and you don't have to come up and brag or anything like that, but, Pastor, I love you. Just show them that you love them by your actions. Amen? Amen. Glory to God. Amen. And I love you, my little Elaine. I love my <laughs> pastor. Pastor Ken, I love you. I love you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank the Lord. I want you all to know I'm number one again. His puppy passed away to heaven, and now I am number one. I am the queen again. What are you eating? I see you're eating something. I'm, I might want some. 
why didn't you go get a hot tamale? You couldn't eat it like that. Oh, okay. Okay, you just, okay, good. I got you. Go, no, go ahead. Go ahead and eat. It don't matter to me. I love her. She's so special. All of you are so special. When I look around, I've been asking for you for two services. Where is my worshiper at? I, I have videos of you, and, and certain days I'll be worshiping God, and I'll just watch you <laughs> on, my, on my phone. I love it. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here. It's so great to be in the house of God tonight. Um, I have some things that I want to say, and I've got about three things running in my head at the same time. And, you know, that's dangerous to preach three sermons in one night, you know, because uh, we might be here for a while. But the other, I want to tell you a sweet thing, and I probably told you this last year, but somebody might not have heard it. At Joyce's house, she has ducks and birds, all kinds of birds, different kinds of ducks, uh, hummingbirds. And so I'm sitting there today, and I'm looking at all these little birds, and I'm thinking, I wonder what it would be like to fly like a bird. What would it be like to fly like a duck? You know, one of these days, we are going to fly. And we don't have to have wings, and we don't have to worry about gravity, whether we can stay up or not. Uh, what would it be like to be a, 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 a bird? The other day, I have a, a, we live in a log home up in the hills of Alabama, and uh, we live in about 160 or maybe more acres, maybe not that many, I'm not sure, but it's way over 100. And we're the only house up on this uh, hill or mountain because one day I was sitting in my motor home and the Lord said to me, I'm going to give you a mountain. Well, at the time, I'm sitting there looking at Lookout Mountain. And Lookout Mountain runs from Tennessee way, way, way down in Alabama. Is that right? From Tennessee. To, it's a huge mountain. And I'm looking at Lookout Mountain. But that wasn't the mountain he was talking about. It was the mountain behind me. And so <clears throat> we bought this property because God asked me to build some healing houses on it. Healing houses. That means when someone is very ill and they can come and get in a prayer line, but they're not taught how to keep their healing, then you need to stay with them or they need to stay with you about a week or two to be taught how to keep their healing. One night, Dr. Norval Hayes and I was sitting in the room. We, we called it the, the, the speaker's lounge. And we were sitting there. Brother Benny Hinn was with us preaching that week. And Benny came in the room and he said, Brother Norval, I have a question for you. Why do I leave a city, and there's many wheelchair patients that are coming through getting healed, and there's many people healed from cancer and twisted limbs, and then they get their miracle and they run all over the place. They jump out of wheelchairs and run. Blind eyes are open. Deaf ears are open. And he said, then I go back the next year, and they're dead. They've died. Or they're crippled again. And Brother Norval said, Benny, that is so simple. You came in with a gift of healing. Now, there are gifts of healing. Then there are moves of the anointing that can move into a church. And that anointing drives out sickness. And then there are people that carry <coughs> the gift of healing, <coughs> excuse me, all the time. But sometimes it just comes on certain people. Now, like me. When I was talking about this man over here that was healed this morning from the fourth stage cancer, remember that? And I showed you his picture. And when my friend there had this big thing in her stomach and God healed her, 
that was because the gift of healing came up on me. I don't carry the gift of healing all the time. I'm not one of those that carries the gift all the time. Thank you. It's that good coffee I drink. I, I, I carry an anointing, and then at times the gift of healing moves upon me. For instance, there was a man in Kokomo, Indiana, and the Lord said, go tell that guy on the back row that I'm healing his hip. So I walk back through the word of knowledge. That's another gift, the word of knowledge. See, the Bible said he doesn't want us to be ignorant of these gifts. We've been given gifts in the Holy Spirit. Everybody that's baptized in the Holy Spirit can use these gifts, but all of them but one is as God wills. And we need to understand that these gifts are real. And that God has called you when he baptized you in the Holy Spirit. He gave you these gifts. So this man was sitting back there. And the Lord said, go tell him I'm healing his hip. But when I went back there and told him that, he said, no, sweetheart. That can't be right. He said, I have just had a surgery. And there's plates and rods and screws here in my leg and my hip. He said, God is not healing my hip. Well, I knew what God told me. I knew what God told me to say. And now I'm finding out what the man had. He had surgery. And he has a plate. And he has a rod. And he has screws. So I said to him, sir, as I was ministering at the front, minding my own business, which is God's business, he asked me to walk back here and tell you that he's healing your hip. Now, I know I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but if I had all that wrong with my hip and somebody that doesn't even know me comes to me and says, God is healing your hip, I would be excited. Wouldn't you? Every one of us would. So I said, sir, he told me to come and tell you that. So he's, he's healing you. He said, honey, now you're a sweet little girl. Here's what he said to me. He said, now you're a sweet little girl, but God is not healing my hip. So I just walked away and I turned around and I said, God said he's healing your hip. He said, no, he isn't. Well, what else can you do? I mean, we could stand there and talk back to each other all night and not do any good. So I walked back up to the front of the church, but in three weeks, the pastor is phoning me. And he said, you know the man that God told you that he was healing his hip? I said, yes. He said, after you left town, the very next morning, his hip started burning like fire and hurting him so bad he could hardly stand it. And finally, after a week of pain, he went to the doctor, and there's bones growing in his hip. <clears throat> the doctors had taken them away. Now, I said that to say this. These gifts are so wonderful, but I don't carry that gift 24-7. That gift comes on me. I really carry the word of knowledge more prevalent than I do the gift of healings. I move in the gifts of miracles, but that the word of knowledge is sometimes absolutely astonishing. Like I was in the prison preaching, and God said, walk over here to this lady and tell her. There was a thousand inmates in this room. 
and said, go tell her that she has sugar diabetes, high blood pressure, cholesterol's bad, and a, a heart disease. So I walk over and I tell her, she said, that's right. I said, it runs in your family. She said, yes. Now I'm over here and all of a sudden God said, walk all the way to the other end and tell that lady over there the same thing you just told her. And I did. And it was her sister. Now, those are, those are very astonishing things. I have a book, My Eyes Have Seen the Glory, and, and I'm just reminded of one time. Ken's got one right here. Uh, there's a lady in here named Elizabeth. Elizabeth came to my service, and she said uh, uh, she came with her daughter and son-in-law, and uh, they had been smoking uh, marijuana and every fussing and fighting all the way to church. But she comes in and sits down. And the Lord said, go tell that lady she has a tumor in her left lung and it's cancer. So I didn't hesitate because I know the voice of the Lord. If you're going to move in the word of knowledge, you have to know the voice of the Lord. That's the first thing you've got to learn. You've got to learn the voice of the Lord. Because remember, he says, I would not have you ignorant concerning these spiritual gifts. And most churches, not this church, because you've been taught. Pastor Jim laid a foundation. Pastor Joanna is, is working and building on this same foundation that her father did. And they, and they have built you up and taught you the truth. But most churches have no idea in this uh, 20, 21 year anything about the Holy Ghost moving in the gifts. You would be surprised where I go. And they know nothing about the gifts. And they are supposed to be full gospel. So this Elizabeth lady in one of the stories in this book She's standing there, and God said she has a tumor in her left lung. Go back there and tell her that I, I want to heal her. So I said, ma'am, before I could get there, the Lord said she's just been to the doctor, and they've uh, analyzed her and told her uh, that, that this is what she has. So I said, ma'am, would you stand? And she stood. And I said, you have a tumor in your left lung. And she said, oh, that's true, that's true. And I said, you've just been to the doctor, and the doctor told you that it's cancer. And she said, yes, yes, that's right. And I said, well, God sent me here because he wants to heal you. Now, when I say he wants to heal you, what about 1 Peter 2.24, by his stripes you were healed. Well, you were healed. But the manifestation of the healing is what we're looking for because you've already been healed. If I say to you, I want to give you this book, and, and I walk over and I say, I want to give you this book, and I hand it to you, and you say, Elaine, please give me the book. Elaine, please give me the book. Uh, I'm giving you the book, and you say, please give me the book. Please give me the book. I've given you the book. Pretty please give me the book. I'm giving you the book. Give it to me, please. See, she just keeps on begging me. Yeah. She just keeps on begging me. And I've already given it to her. But she keeps on begging me. And that's the way the Lord is. He's already given us all these spiritual blessings. Ephesians 1, 1, 3, I've already given you every spiritual blessing. I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. I've already given it to you. Yes, and I've given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. I've already given it to you. And, and, and we just keep on begging. More. Give me more. I'm so hungry for more. Well, if you really are hungry, listen, open your eyes and open your ears. He's already given it to you. So what do we do? She was already healed 2,000 years ago, but now she has a tumor in her left lung, and the doctor says she's got cancer. So what am I doing? I want to bring what's in the spirit into the flesh realm. It's already in the spirit realm. I've already given you all things that pertain to life and
and godliness. And I've already blessed you with all spiritual blessings. So I started to lay my hands on this lady. And when I started to lay my hands on her, the Lord said, don't lay your hands on her. Now, oh, wait a minute, God. Now, wait a minute. You want me to go back here? You want me to tell this woman she has a cancer in her left lung, a tumor? It's cancer. She's been to the doctor. She says, yes, yes, yes. Tears are streaming down her face. And then have my hands up like this to touch her. Don't touch her. I just dropped my hands. Because I hear the voice of God better than I hear you. Thank you, Father. Now, now remember those words right there. And in a few minutes, you yell at them to me if I don't go back to it. I hear the voice of God better than I hear you. I can hear the voice of God. Ken and I can be driving down the road. And I say, oh, Lord, thank you for the host of heaven that is surrounding us. And every scheme and demonic plan of the devil is broken over us and our car will be safe. And we'll go right down a mile and there'll be somebody turn in front of you or there'll be somebody, you know, act crazy, driving crazy. And we have already covered it with the host of heaven because we can command the host of heaven to guard us. Just like many times when you were dancing tonight and you had the sword out and you were going around, the Lord spoke to me and said many times she has been in the power of death and I have su su I have put my anointing around her and would not let her die. And I saw soldiers, and I saw people, and I saw drug curtail, and I saw people with knives and guns that would have come after her, and they could not touch her. I saw that when she was dancing. I went into a vision and saw that while she was dancing. So I dropped my hands. And I thought, now, God, what am I going to do? I've got her standing up. I've told her all these things, and then you won't let me pray for her. He said, ask her how many cigarettes she smokes a day. And I'm thinking, dear God, why do I have to ask such a person? Oh, you know, how many candy bars do I eat? How many tamales do I want? You know, it's all habits. It's all bad. Sugar's bad. It's all bad. And I'm thinking, well, I said, ma'am, okay, God. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know what? It's better to obey God than man. <laughs> and most of the time it's this man that I don't need to obey. If you're going to work in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you better not obey you. You better obey God. So I said, Elizabeth, I didn't know her name at that time, but I just said, lady, what? Well, how many cigarettes do you smoke a day? And she cried out worse. She said, oh, I smoke three packs a day. I said, you smoke three packs? How? She said, I light it up when I'm in the bed. When I first open my eyes, I reach for my cigarettes and my lighter. And I get my cigarette and I go to the restroom and while I'm in the restroom, I smoke that, and I put it out, and I light one off of it because I'm a chain smoker, especially in the morning with my coffee. And she said, then I go out to the kitchen, and I light up another one. And she said, for an hour or two, I just light off the other one, and I smoke. Well, I said, okay. And then the Lord said, ask her if she'll be willing to stop smoking because I don't want her to die with this cancer. See, God's not willing that any should perish. He don't want anybody to perish. He wants us all to live and be happy and be healthy and be, and you know, full of joy. He wants us all to fulfill the will that he's planned for us. Sister Joyce and I was talking as we had our cup of coffee. And you know what happened? We was talking about how that, you know, it's God. You are what you've been through life's experiences have created you to who you are right now and the good you got to keep and the bad you got to get out 
However, this woman told me how she smoked. And the Lord said to me, tell her I want to deliver her from nicotine. And I said, God wants to deliver you from nicotine and the cigarettes so that he can uh, 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 let you live and not die. And she said, oh, no, honey, I tried to quit smoking so many times. She said, it's a useless thing. I cannot quit smoking. There's no way I can do that. And I said, but God said for me to tell you he wants to deliver you, ma'am. I didn't know anything about you. Uh, your your life and your situation er- interrupted my message, and I have stopped to tell you the truth. Now, if God had me stop and tell you the truth, don't you know that I'm hearing the voice of God and that he says he wants to deliver you from cigarettes? She said, okay. I've been prayed for before and nothing happened. I said, well, something's going to happen this time. And I looked at her and I said, I'm not laying my hands on you until I tell you what God told me to say. If you even smell cigarette smoke, you will regurgitate. And her eyes just got big. And if you put one to your mouth, you will be violently sick. You will hate cigarettes. You can't stand cigarettes. They have put a big tumor in your left lung, and you will never be able to smoke another one from this day forth. That's what I say. Now, what was happening? Not only was the gift of the word of knowledge working, but the gift of miracles was working. It's a miracle to get anybody off of cigarettes like that. 27 years, three packs a day. That's a gift of miracles. So here we have the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, the gift of word of knowledge, the gift of prophecy. You will hate cigarettes. Remember that one? I'm prophesying to her. I'm speaking the future to her. And she said, okay. I said, now step out in the aisle. I'm ready to lay my hands on you now. And I laid my hands on her. I commanded nicotine cravings out, all of it out of her blood, all of it out of her head, the habit leave, the torturing in her mind to leave. I commanded her body to hate nicotine. If she smells it or if she smokes another cigarette, she will regurgitate. Remember that? It'll make her violently sick if she even gets around a cigarette to smoke it. Now you foul cancer. Come out of her. I curse you. The root and the seedbed die. And she went limp out in the spirit. She got up after a while. That night when church was over, She walked out to her car where she usually was getting a cigarette after church out of her pocketbook on the way to the car because she'd been in there and couldn't stand it. She didn't touch them. She threw them in the garbage. She has never smoked another one. And if she, she lived with me for a while. I took her in and gave her a place to live. Didn't I, Ken? I don't know how many years. April of 1991, and here it is, 2021, and she's still living and does not have cancer and does not have a tumor and has never smoked again. That's what's in this book, those kind of testimonies. My eyes have seen the glory. The forward is by Dr. Norval Hayes. All right. What did I tell you to yell at me? I was just checking you out. So, when you are going to move in the Holy Spirit, you must learn the voice of God. Yell for me, Ken. Say, hey, baby. Oh, see, I knew that's not the right one. 
Say it again. Say it again. Amen. See the difference? Do you see the difference? Say it. See? Doesn't even sound like the same voice because it isn't the same voice. Why do I know his voice? Say it. Because I've been with him 43 years. He can call me on the phone and I can be in Africa preaching and I know it's his voice. I know it's not Pastor uh, uh, Joanna or Pastor Jeff. I know it's not any of you because I know his voice. But how do I learn his voice? I learn his voice by spending time listening to him. He can even say something else. You can't fool me. I love you too. Because I know that. I know what he likes to eat. I know what he likes to wear. I know what he likes to do. He is absolutely in heaven sitting over there talking to Pastor Jim. And they're working out all the world's political scene. They're working out every problem of the, and they're just talking back and forth. I went in the bedroom and I said, oh boy, he's having a good time. He loves to talk to somebody that's intelligent. He don't have a whole lot of patience for stupidity. So if I get stupid sometimes, he just says, Whoop, and turns me off. I know him. I know him. He wants to get up early. He wants to leave early. He wants to be somewhere. I ain't going to say on time. I'm not, I'm not talking about time no more. I'm through. I'm through. He wants, to, he wants to be the first one there. He wants to, to uh, do everything, you know, on time. He wants to be at that church. He wants to welcome everybody, handshaking and talking. And I say, Ken, we don't have to be there 30 minutes early. We don't. He said, well, you just stay here and drive your car, and I'll drive mine. <laughs> I know him. And the way I know his voice is because I hear it. And the only way you're going to know the voice of God enough to flow in the gifts of the Spirit is to be with him. Now remember this. Remember this. Because God wants us to be sober. He wants us to be vigilant. We're in a war right now. Whether you know it or not, there's a sifting. There's a shifting. And there is a soaring power of God that's been released. And I'm not trying to get you to be Republican or Democrat or Independent or Patriot or nothing else. I'm just telling you there has been a shift. And it's a big shift. So, you know, we can think a lot of things, but 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. I dare you to say, I'm in love with Jesus. And he's in love with me. Are you ready? He says, I have not seen, nor ear heard. I'm still old-fashioned. I don't trust them sometimes. I just got to have this book. All right. Verse 9 says, But as it is written, I have not seen. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. Everybody got it? All right. He says, But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor hath entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those that love him. And you just made a confession with your mouth. I'm in love with Jesus, and he's in love with me. 
So you're one of these people that he's talking about. I have not seen. And I want to remind you that in the day you're living in, in this sifting and this shifting, and we're going in, we're, we're having one of the most wonderful awakenings that's ever been. There's, there's Mario Morello out there in that big tent in Bakersville, California. And people are moaning. They're just sitting there, and all of a sudden they just start, oh, it's a, it's a move of the Holy Spirit. They just start moaning. And, and 300 people runs in in one night and gets saved. Well, what's God doing the moaning for? Well, I don't know, and it's really none of my business. I just want to moan with them. I want to groan. I want to laugh. I don't know what happened to Kenneth Hagin when he would get in one of them Holy Ghost services. I mean, it's funny. Go on the Internet. Go on YouTube and watch him. And he just goes, he just walks up to somebody and goes, <laughs> see? And then he start laughing. And then he goes, Whew, and everybody falls out. Why does God do stuff like that? I do not know. I don't know why God made a black cow eat green grass and give white milk. I don't know why God picks old, you know, southern girls from Knoxville, Tennessee. Red-headed. Sometimes skinny, sometimes not. All kinds of different. I don't know why God would call me. Why? I don't know. I don't know why God called you. But he did. And now he says, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. It hadn't entered into the heart of man. The things which God has prepared for those that love him. And you know what the Lord wanted me to tell you tonight? Things are about to happen to you, and you haven't seen them, and you haven't heard them, and it's not even entered into your heart yet. You haven't even thought about it yet. But some things are about to start happening to Abundant Grace Church, and things are about to happen to you, and things are about to happen to you, and things are about to happen to y'all, and it's going to be awesome. Because right at this point right now, it ain't even entered into your eyes. You ain't seen it, you hadn't heard it, and you hadn't even had it in your heart. I don't know why. Bring me that bucket over there under your seat, sweet girl. I like you moaning in the Holy Ghost when you're up there on the stage. Yeah, bring me that bucket. I don't know why. I don't know why God does the things he does. What makes you up there on that stage? And when you give out that, oh, the anointing, the anointing flows through here. It's awesome. Do it. Let me hear you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Makes me want to do it. I don't know why. I don't know why. I don't know why, Mr. Seymour on Azusa Street, would walk out and sit down, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the service. The service would be going on. Here he'd come out with this box on his head. And sit there for sometimes an hour and a half. And everybody just sitting there staring at him. Don't get scared, Ken. I'm fine. Since I'm number one, he takes real good care of me. I just thought I'd move over here. He just sit there for an hour and a half and say nothing. Be hard for me. Nobody left. And then all of a sudden, he just stand up and take the box off his head 
and blind eyes would start being open and deaf ears would start being open and God would start doing all kinds of miracles. What did the box have to do with on his head? What, what, what was in the box? There wasn't nothing in the box. What was what was obedience? We have a problem thinking everything has got to look good for everybody. Everything don't have to look good for everybody. Everything don't have to seem right. He says, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, nor had it entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those that love him. But, somebody say, but, God has revealed them to us through the Spirit. But God has revealed them to us through the Spirit. So if we want to know why a light would come down from heaven and guide the children of Israel at night and a cloud by day, and why God would have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into a furnace of fire heated seven times hotter and the people that threw them in died. But they're in there like there's a heavenly air conditioner on. Their hair wasn't burned. Their clothes didn't smell like smoke. None of that. Why? I'm going to tell you. Everything that is about to happen to you and to this church and to me and Ken and I's ministry is because God is doing a shifting and a sifting and God is doing a soaring Holy Spirit firebrand upon us and we are the head and we are not the tail and we are above and we are not beneath. And furthermore, all the hell that you've been through in the last year is over. Say, Lord, thank you that you let me live to magnify your name. What a blessing. There was a lot of good Christian people that went on to be with the Lord. But thanks be unto God, we stayed. Say, why did we stay and all those others pass? Because we have a job and we're in this last day move of Holy Ghost revival. We're in this day of Holy Ghost revival. And God has equipped us. And we have let him sand us down and mold us and cut things off of us and train our ears to hear his voice. And he's pleased with that. He's pleased. Hey, 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 all that God, now this is the Amplified. Listen to the Amplified. All that God has made, prepared, and keeps ready for those that love Him. Made, prepared, and keeps ready for those that love Him. Made, prepared, and keeps ready for those that love Him. Made and prepared and keeps ready for those that love Him. And called according to His purpose. But God has revealed them to us 
through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So what is that sifting that's been going on? He's searching for the deep things. You listen to me. You are an elect group. You are a remnant group. You are a end time generals army group. And God has been searching all things. Yes, the deep things. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him. You know what? You don't know everything about me, but the Spirit does. You know what I tell you. You know I like Delia's. How do you know? I told you. I like shoes. How do you know? Because I told you. I like color. I like clothes that have color. When I found these green pants a few years ago, I just went wild in the store. <laughs> Everybody wouldn't wear these. They're too out. They're too wild. I'm a little Hispanic. I'm a little bit white. I'm a little bit black. I got, I'm, a, I'm a white woman on the outside, but I'm all these other women on the inside. I got all these colors. I like jewelry. I like Everything, And I know why I like jewelry now. Because when you visit heaven, you'll know why you like jewelry too. Everything there is glitzy and beautiful and colorful. Flowers sing. Brother Norval had a white robe on one time when he went to heaven. And he went over and there was this big tree. And it had fruit on it. And he said, it wasn't like a, a mango. It wasn't like a peach. It wasn't like a pear. It was like something he's never seen before. And he reached up and got one of them. Brother Norval loved to eat. He was I was with him 31 years. Every year. And he loved to eat. He just loved food. We was in Palm Springs, California one day, and he said, Elaine, after church today, come and go with me. We're going to a restaurant. I said, what are we going to get? He said, here's what he said, peach lush. I said, what's a peach lush? Just come and order it. And it was this crust with pecans. It was, it was a crust, the, uh, like a pie crust, but it was made with, with pecans and, and flour and, you know, butter. Lots of Paula Dean butter. Oh, it was baked. And then after it was baked, it had this cream cheese and, and uh, 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 powdered sugar and little cream mixture. And then on top of that was peach pudding and then there was fresh peaches on top of it and then there was peach cool whip peach lush so we go in there and he orders him some fried chicken and something and I'm ordering and then he said now take a bite of this peach lush and he's just can't wait you can see the water kind of running down his mouth right here he got his fork and he said, Elaine, I went to heaven one day. I loved his stories. Elaine, I went to heaven one day. And he said, honey, I picked a fruit off of a tree. And he said, it wasn't like a peach. It wasn't like a pear. It wasn't like a mango. It wasn't an apricot. He said, it was something else. And he said, I was dressed in white. I thought, as he said that, I looked over there at a big blop on his shirt. <laughs> we used to go preach. And before we'd walk in, I'd say, Brother Norval, we got to go by the restroom and get some. We, look, 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 look here. Oh, well, that's what I had for lunch or whatever. I don't know what he said. He'd say something funny. But anyway, you know what? He said, when I took a bite of it, the juice just dripped off my chin and ran down on my white robe. And I said, oh, no, I've messed up my white robe. But he said, as soon as I looked down, it was gone. 
He said, Elaine, there's no drips and no garbage in heaven. He said, I ate the whole fruit, and he said, it slipped out of my hand like a little seed. And he said, I reached down to get it, and it was gone. He said, just cleaned up just like that, just gone. He said, then I'm in my white robe, and I see this river, this water, this lake, this beautiful, beautiful water. And he said, I said, oh, I love water. He loved water. He would swim with sharks in Hawaii. You go out there, and there'd be sharks. Brother Norval, they got a shark. (laughs) Warning. It's okay, I have dominion over them. Oh, yeah. I forgot. (laughs) He wasn't afraid of sharks. I got it. I got the authority over them. God gave it to me. He gave me authority over all things. I said, oh, okay. All right. Oh, and so he said, in heaven, Elaine, I just had on my pretty white robe. I just walked in the water. He said, I got up to my knees, up to my waist, up to my neck. And he said, then I was totally under the water. And I was just like a fish breathing. He said, I was just under the water, just breathing. He said, in heaven, there's no drowning. (laughs) He loved this valley so much. He really loved Pastor Jim. He really loved you. (laughs) He loved this church. (laughs) Elaine, come and go with me to Rio Grande Valley. (laughs) We eat Mexican food. (laughs) Miss Joyce will drive us to Luby's. He said. (laughs) He did. And so he, he told me all about heaven. And, you know, my eyes haven't seen all of what he, I've seen some of heaven, but I haven't seen all of it. And and my ears haven't heard everything. But guess what? The Spirit can show us anything about heaven. We're only one breath away. What? God. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. You want to know the deep things of God? Of course you do, little children. Of course you do. That's We want to. It's available. It's available. We can know anything about God, the Holy Ghost, that we want. We have no limit. There's no limit on what we can have and know. He says he don't want us to be ignorant uh, concerning the Holy Spirit gifts. And he says in his Bible he's given us all spiritual blessings. And he says what eye has not seen and ear has not heard. Neither has it entered into the heart of man all that God has made prepared and keeps ready for those that ultimately and lovingly worship him and desire him. The Spirit shows us these things. I don't know about you, but when I start thinking about what my eyes have already seen and what I want to see, it's exciting. And all I got to do is get in the spirit. Well, it's one thing for you to come in here and tell me, Miss Elaine. It's one thing for you to tell me that the spirit knows it all and will tell me, how am I going to get that spirit, God, the Holy Ghost? You have to get in the spirit. And you can't mind the things of the flesh. Romans 8 chapter says, if you mind the things of the flesh, 
you'll die. But if you, through the Spirit, mortify the deeds of this body, you will live. Don't walk by the dictates of our flesh. Don't walk by what we see, what we feel, what the doctor says. What? What? Well, there's some good doctors, but there's never been a doctor like Jesus. I have doctor friends all over the world. They don't know what Jesus knows. They don't know what God the Father knows. They don't know what the Spirit knows. Do they? Somebody tell me, do they know? They're practicing. But I know one that knows every cell in your body. He knows your fingerprints. He knows the hair that falls out when you wash your hair in the morning. When I wash my hair in the morning on Monday, there will be a few hairs come out. Because every time you wash your hair, you lose 10 or 15 hairs. You know what I mean? Every time. He knows the counts of my hair on my head. He knows every cell in my body. He knows my DNA. He knows every eye uh, mark. He knows every fingerprint. He's made everybody different. He knows everything about us. He knows where we're going. He knows where we're be- where we've been. He knows what he wrote in the book before the foundation of the world. He said before the foundation of the world, he wrote your life in a book. Psalm 139, before you were curiously wrought in your mama's womb, before Pastor Joanna was even out of her daddy's loins and that little fetus started growing in that little beady body over there, God already knew what Joanna was going to do. And all she had to do is just cooperate. He knew she'd marry him. Don't he have pretty hair? Ken was talking about a while ago. Jeff has pretty houses. Jeff has pretty hair. He's a mechanic. He can tell you everything about a car. I don't know how to change a tire, but he does. He knows how to live with a woman preacher. So does Ken. (laughs) A lot of men don't. It's hard. I got to go. I got to go pray. I got to go. I got to go study. I got to go. I got to go preach. I got to. I got to. I got to. But it's written down in a book. And your life is in that book. Every one of you. What I have not seen, what a ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. All that God makes, prepares, and keeps ready for those that affectionately love him. And called according to his purpose. I wish I could whistle Andy Griffith. I would. He knows. He knows. What am I going to do? I want to know. How many of you want to know? You want to know? I know why you want to know, because I know your heart. You want to know so you can get on with the program. Right? I'm not old, but bless God, I'm not as young as I used to be, but I can still go. I'm, I'm still young. Make sure you get that on your camera. I'm still young. I know I'm still young. But I'm not as young as I used to be. So I'm middle-aged. I've got to get on with the program. If I'm going to live to be 90, I mean, you know, I've got a good long while to go. But I've got to know what the Holy Ghost wants. Because he said, if you through the Spirit search, he revealed them to us through the Spirit. I'm closing. I'm closing. I promise you, if you will come to these meetings every night, you're going to get blessed. And I won't keep you out too late. Because I know you have to go home and eat a tamale or something. (laughs) 
But stand up, Eddie, with a hat on. I love hats. I like hats on men and women. Do you know why that you have persevered in the things that you've persevered and how you've gone? You know, your steps have gone this way. and Then God would say, go that way. And then God would say, go this way. And you just kept on following him when it didn't look like to a lot of people that you were even making any sense. But you were making sense. It's because before the foundation of the world, he wrote your life in a book. And uh, come here, Ken. If you live to be 75 years, I know it. If you live to be 85 years old, according to God's time in heaven, a year is as a thousand, I mean, a day is as a thousand years, right? If you live to be 85 years old, you will only have lived point zero eight six five of a second. Of a second! According to God's time. A day is as a thousand years. So I don't know how old you are right now. Don't tell me. But if you're, it, it, just think, even if you're 85 years old, you have not even probably lived a, a, a .045875, whatever, second of heaven time. What, what is this that God is doing? See, what is this? All these years you've lived, you've done that, you've done that, you've done that, you've done that, you've done this, you've done this, you've done that. And all that seems so much. But in God's time, it wasn't that much compared to a day is as a thousand years. So get ready. Somebody better get behind him, please. Hurry. Hurry, y'all. I'm saying hurry for a reason. The Lord said to tell you, you have followed me through the thick and through the thin, through the hard struggles, through the broken and through the great times. But I'm nowhere near through with you because I will take you out to take you in. And you know what I'm doing right now? I am stirring you up by the laying on of my hands. That's pretty convenient. It's all right. It's all right. He's he's getting it. He's drunk. He's getting it. And we don't need Jack Daniels to make us happy. We don't take our trips on LSD. We don't smoke our joint down at the courthouse. White lightning don't matter to you and me. We're proud to be a Christian. Hallelujah. And you are much stronger than you ever gave credit of being. You are much stronger than anybody around you knows. There is a place in God that you dwell in. And he said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Uh, uh, uh. It feels so good. Uh. 
let that, let that anointing flow. Let that deep cry out to the deep right now. That's an awesome anointing. That's an awesome anointing. Preso, preso. Stand up, ma'am. You. Pero vos obreya. Sera masita revesera. De vos Come on up just a little bit. There we go. Where are you from? From Africa. What part? Near Nigeria. I went to Nigeria. The first night I spoke was to 10,000 people in a big warehouse building. A big warehouse building. It was awesome. I went to Calabar. Is that Calabar? Abba, you know where that's at, Abba, the queen came of a, of a country over there to my meeting, and when she walked in, she was beautiful, yeah, and she had this big wrap on her head and jewels hanging off of it. She was gorgeous and a long, gorgeous dress. And the Lord told me to tell her, you have a heart condition. You have this heart condition and God's going to heal you. And she fell out in the spirit. And the next day they called me to the palace and I prayed for the king. His foot was rottening. Ugh. You know God sent me there. And you know God sent you here. Didn't he? Didn't he send you here? It's not easy. Nothing's easy. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers them out of them all. So it is hard. It is hard for a, a, a season. It is rough. It is saying, oh God, what must I do? Where would I go? What would I say? And God said, Amen. follow me. What's your name? Julie. Julie. Walk in my precepts. Walk in my statute because Amen. I have a job for you to complete. Amen. You are an intercessor. You touch God for people that they don't even know about. You're a holy woman of God. Be healed in the name of Jesus. From the top of her head to the soles of her feet. The fire of God is burning now. The fire of the Holy Ghost is burning on Julie now. And I say unto you, O woman of God, you're a queen in God's heaven. <sighs> oh, you're a queen in God's heaven. He has called you his queen. He has called you his queen. You might not feel like you have accomplished a lot, but the doors of heaven are going to burst open one day. And your reward is going to be so great. And the I count it an honor. Your family's not, what did you say? Your whole family. Your son, your girls, your family, your whole world. I 
I am honored that God would even let me speak to you. You're going to find out one day when you stand there and you think some of these big, big, big name preachers are going to walk in and get these great big trophies and these big things. And then you're going to see, was it Julie or Judy? When you see Julie walk in and here is this host of angels and she's got the biggest mansion and the biggest trophies and the biggest rewards of anybody there. You're going to say, oh, my. I count it an honor that the Lord would even let me pre preach and prophesy to her. I count it an honor that God would even let me speak to her. Give it away. Ken said, give it away. Ken said, give it away. Here, Julie, that's for you to buy you something with. Would you buy yourself something? Would you buy yourself something? Something you need. Buy you. Would you take her shopping? I gave her some shopping. Do you, who knows? Okay, well, that's good. That's who I need. Here, take her. Take her. I want her to have something new. Okay? Holy woman of God. Holy woman of God. Wanna be more like you every day. I wanna be more like you in every way. I wanna be more like you, Jesus. When I was in Africa. I got out of the car one night, and all up and down the sidewalk was little children laying on the on the sidewalk. Laying. And I said to my driver, what is going on? They said they heard that someone was coming that prayed for the sick, and these children are sick, and they've laid them out here hoping you'll pass by them and they'll get a miracle like they did in the Bible. Isn't that faith? Isn't that faith? And when you walk down through them, they were, it was like a hundred and something degrees that night. And you know what? They had no air conditioning in the church. It was so hot. And I wore a hat on my head because they told me to cover my head. Let me borrow your hat. So I had my hat on. And I was walking through and I was thinking, oh God. You know, sometimes the things that God asks you to do is so humbling. You know who you are. You know what you've been through. You know where you've been. And then you go and God just. And I was walking through those little children. And they were getting up healed. Every one of them getting up healed. So that night, there was a lady. I didn't know her. The Lord gave me a word of knowledge. And I promise I'm going to shut up after this. I promise I'm going to let you go. But all of a sudden, the Lord said, I want to heal a lady's knee. And I said, who has got a broken or hurt knee? And about 500 people jumped up. I, I said, wait a minute. I prayed a mass prayer. And they all went, they all went back to their seat. And I said, now listen to me. 
there is someone here that has a dire death sentence. And it's something to do with your leg, your knee. And here they come carrying in this woman. She had been run over by a taxi. And her leg was in a, in a gauze. And the gauze was green because gangrene had set in. And they wanted to amputate her leg. But she was waiting for the woman of God to come from America. So they carried her up there. And I prayed for her. And as she started dancing on that leg that was supposed to be cut off, the gall started unraveling. The gall started unraveling, and she was totally healed. That all happened in Africa. And now God sends these girls over here to us. We're so blessed to have you. We're so blessed to have you. You have a real gift. You are gifted in the spirit. And you know that. And you have something to give. And I want you to just give it to me. I want you to just, just pray over me, honey. I love you. Just pray over me. going to turn the service over to precious Joanna. I love her. And I want, yes, give her a big cheer. Big cheer. Time flies when you're here. It's only two more nights now. So bring somebody with you. Bring someone with you. And we will see God move. I have these books back on the table. Maybe the Lord will allow me to speak a little bit about this tomorrow night. I hope so. But anyway, these are my books. And uh, I'm getting calls from Hong Kong. <laughs> I'm getting calls from Sweden. Ken, help me. Where have I? I've had phone calls from uh, all over America, all over uh, South America. Jamaica, everywhere, I, since I was on Sid Roth, Norway, people are calling from all over the world for prayer. At, for the first couple of weeks after I was on Sid Roth, the uh, phone would ring. We couldn't even answer the phone fast enough from people all over the world. And they'd say, I'm dying and I need healing and I need prayer. And we would just pray and pray. Me and Ken, he took over. He'd pray a while and then I'd pray a while. It was something else. They gave them our uh, private home number, uh, Ken's private number, and it was printed on the screen. And, honey, we prayed night and day because their time's different, you know. And then phones were ringing constantly, and you know me. I didn't want to not pray for them, so we just took turns. It's a good deal. I love you so much. I really do. God bless you.